You're listening to the Race to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out Race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron Mack, to other co-hosts. You may have seen walking out of Barber Lounge 459 with a big old smile on his face. You've probably seen him at a dirt track. He's one and only Scott Bowie. Hey, man, third time we've done this intro tonight. Um, and third time is a charm, right? Yeah, no. Uh, before this podcast started, Aaron told me the S a D. So that's, <laughs> uh, we've had some laughs over that. But uh, <laughs> no, it's been a good week. Uh, what's up with you, bud? Man, it's, it's been a great week. Great long weekend. Um, Labor Day weekend. I got to spend Friday um, at Indianapolis Raceway Park for the U.S. Nationals, hanging out with a um, good friend of the show, Mr. Antron Brown, his team Friday. Um, got to do some filming, so we'll, I'll be releasing a little video about that um, sometime in the future, but great weekend. And, um, you know, he, he won, so he won the whole thing. So really cool to see him win. You know, it can't happen to a more deserving person. I think you would really um, definitely agree with that. Great guy. As you have said before, you would run through a wall for Antron Brown. I would and I, I would as well. You know, I got to see him interact with fans a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and he's just, he, he's just a, a riot to be around. Great guy, hysterical. Um, and just, I mean, just a good person. Great person. Yeah, I, I think he is an absolute model for – how people should be in the sport and not just drivers, just mm -hmm. the way he interacts with others. And he, he, sure. uh, he's, a, he's a very conscientious kind man. And, uh, just, I wish him nothing but all the success he can get because, uh, you, you, you put so much positive in the world. I I'd like to see that come back to him. Yeah. You know, and the, the thing that's, cool with Antron is he really understands how motorsports work. I mean, there's a lot of people in motorsports that may not really understand everything that's involved, but he understands to the nuts and bolts of motorsports and he understands just how it all goes full circle. Um, and you know, that's probably part of the reason why he's just so engaging because he understands that, you know, just what's involved and, you know, everyone, you just got to make an impression with a lot of people because you never know who you I, may I be agree. interacting with. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I mean, we could go on and on and on about Antron. I, he is truly somebody I have nothing, like I said, this the utmost respect for. Um, so it's so awesome to see him win out mm -hmm. there. You know, winning is a kind of a big, uh, big thing with our guests, right? Will Powers leading IndyCar points. Yeah. Jagger Jones won Rookie of the Year. Um, Cape Motorsports, who we spent a lot of time with this year, won the championship with uh, Michael D. Orlando, and hopefully we can get Michael on the show next few weeks. Um, yeah, I mean, just uh, it's been a good year for people that we've gotten lucky to be able to talk to and be around. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I think the common, I think what I figured out what the common denominator is, is that they're around you. And they, when someone's around you, right. they just start winning. I didn't want to say that, but I think you're right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, so IndyCar Portland, um, obviously, before we get into the IndyCar race, Jagger Jones, good friend of the show, obviously. USF 2000, um, you know, kind of had some issues in qualifying, um, but second race, you know, he, Started well, 17th and finished fourth. Well, right? third race. It third was, race. You know, his bad. first yeah. two races went terribly for him. Um, you know, really is unfortunately his worst two runs of the year. Just it's kind of the nature of Portland. That first turn, man, can be uh, can be very complicated for some. And uh, but that being said, uh, third race started 17th, ran fourth. Uh, Cape Drivers ran 1-2. Michael D. Orlando, by virtue of winning the race, and Miles Rowe running uh, fifth behind Jagger, uh, ended up winning the championship. So, you know, good for Michael D. Orlando. Uh, Cape Motorsports wins their last race in USF 2000. 
as they head off to Indy Lights next year. So they went out in style. Um, Indy car racing itself, man, you know, who'd ever thought they would have ran that many laps in Portland without a yellow, but they ran, I think they only had one yellow in the race. They ran the majority of the race. I mean, like probably 75% of it before, um, before just a really strange crash with uh, Renus VK and and Jimmy Johnson. Um, just two cars, I guess you could say, were trying to share the occupy the same spot in the racetrack, and that doesn't always work. So Jimmy got crashed. Um, but Scott Dixon did what Scott Dixon does. He had a questionable qualifying, but they ran her up to third. Um, but, uh, Scott McLaughlin is showing everybody why he deserves to be in a Penske car and he picks up another win this year. And it was pretty dominating, you know, to be honest. Uh, so congratulations to them and, uh, in the car points, man, that's a really close fight. Yeah. Coming down to the end of the year. I mean, uh. We got Powers ahead. You've got Newgarden and Dixon are 20 out, I believe. And um, I forget who's in fourth. I, I I think it's the top four that have a chance to win the title. I think it's the top four. I don't think the top five, but it could be the top five. But the fourth and fifth are pretty long shots at this point. Um, so it's really down to those three. Right. Um, so we had NASCAR Darlington, um, Eric Jones won. Didn't really watch any of that. Um, but yeah, I like I, said, I didn't I didn't watch any, any of the Darlington race, but you know, Eric Jones won and Denny Hamilton a second. I do know that. Well, it's cool they put the 43 back in victory lane. Sure. Um, although it's not, I mean it's petty, probably mostly in name only. Um, it's cool to see my childhood favorite <laughs> to be sitting in victory lane. So that was awesome. Um, it did since 2014 with Eric Almarola. Um, was the last person to win in the 43 in a range shortened race. Hmm. And then I think before that, it would have to have been maybe Bobby Hamilton. So, and Bubba Wallace had good runs in that car. They just never could pull off a win. Right. Bubba's. Excellent, those big, fast sure. tracks. So, um, unfortunately, I couldn't get a win there, but it was cool to see the 43 in victory lane. Kevin Harvey had a strange fire. Um, his car caught on fire. Uh, I think it was toward closer to the end of the race, and it burnt pretty good. And, you know, drivers are voicing their concerns over fires. I think that's the third or fourth one, all Fords, oddly enough. Um, so I, what I don't, I'm not sure what the difference would be in the Fords versus the Chevys, but you had, you've got that and you got people, you know, that when they're crashing them, they say they hurt, you know, it hurts a lot worse than the previous car. So drivers are really starting to voice their, you know, concerns. And of course, Kevin Harvey's definitely going to voice his. All right. Um, so you'd like to see him get that corrected. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, with the cars, there's always ways to evolve, and, um, you know, they'll, they'll definitely figure it out. Yeah, and then with F1, you had uh, Max winning again. Surprise, surprise. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, George Russell was second. Um, Hamilton, I think, ran – I'm not sure if he ran fourth or fifth. I'm not sure exactly where he ran. I think it was fourth. Um but he was very unhappy with his team afterwards because they left him out on harder tires. Um, and he had some very choice words to say to them um, all over the radio and after the race. Tensions are pretty high at Mercedes, it seems like, uh, especially in Lewis's camp. I think Russell's very happy to be there and just takes what he can get. And then I think Lewis wants to win. He, he's used to performing at high levels, and 
And he's their second, third tier team. I mean, honestly, as far as I think it's safe to say that Red Bull's the best, Ferrari's next best, and then Mercedes. And that doesn't sit well with him, I'm sure. Right. And I mean, you know, when you're used to winning that much, as many championships as he won, and all of a sudden you're not winning. I mean, the best way I think to put it really is his worst day is better than most people's best day. Right. Absolutely. Man, and speaking of F1, all the rumors have heard of, and I, I'm going to butcher the name of this team. Alpha is it Alpha, Alpha Tori? Um, going to Alpha Tori if he can get his super license. So, which a lot of people have pointed out on social media that he has ran more IndyCar races and has more wins than, than uh, Verstappen had when he got his license to run F1 in terms of races and race wins. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. It's something I've seen, but that would probably seem pretty accurate. We need to get David Land on the case. D Land would know that like the back of his hand. What? I did, you said that I got a notification that David Land did something on my Facebook. I love it. I love it. He commented on something. Right when you said I got a notification. That's funny. Um, <laughs> what you said had a you had a kind of an up and down weekend. They went up to Sun Prairie for the midget race. Uh, after hours of the of them trying to get that track done, they could not make it dry enough for the teams to run. A lot of the, a lot of the drivers or some of the drivers had had been to do uh, been to Ducoin or at least on their way to Ducoin. Ducoin gets rained out. They make the trek. I think it's six six and a half hours to Sun Prairie. Sun Prairie gets rained out, and then drivers had to go back to Ducoin today and run the Silver Crown race today. Race had very high attrition. I think only eight cars finished. Um, the car that ran second, I believe, was a lap down. I think there was only, at the end of the race, I think there was only one car on, on the lead lap due to attrition. Shane Cockrum dominated that race, uh, ran out of fuel with like 12 to go, or it may have been more than that to go. And he still ran second. <laughs> oh, wow. So, um, like I said, just a very strange race. Cody Swanson was third. Uh, Logan Seavey was the winner. Uh, so congratulations to him and Robbie Rice and that group. Um, I mean, they, Silver Crown Racing is all about some strategy as well as running uh, running as hard as it'll go because you had driveline issues, fuel issues with uh, more than a handful of cars that were at the front. So, uh, But congratulations to Logan Seavey and in that team and uh silver crown cars they have two more races i believe uh one at the other mile right now which is springfield which is in october and then they have another race at raceway park and i think their season will be over after that yeah. well so like we said last week our guest this week is johnny parsons jr um you know great interview we we did have some um issues i i guess you can say connection issues um but was able to work through them i edited out some of it so um please bear with us if it seemed like there's a little bit of feedback or whatever but it's definitely worth listening to he's definitely a great um great guy to talk to really great stories yeah, johnny uh you know johnny's it's so strange. He comes to Speedway, I believe, I think we talked about in 70. Yeah. So he's really, he's uh, one of the very few drivers who can discuss running those old high, high, high horsepower uh, without really wings, mm -hmm. flat bottom cars um, through when they put the big wings on them to the early ground effects, then the full ground effects. And then even in the RL. The 90s. Yeah. So, I mean, he is truly one of the few drivers that can have that type of conversation. Um, it was just, you know, he was, he was such a great racer. Um, it was just, he, they come along at a strange point of the, the sport where the sport started not looking at that type of racer. And, that, you know, there was, while he, he was able to get rides and run, I, I don't necessarily think that he had the, 
Well, I know he didn't have the full opportunities the generation before him did. And it's too bad, but he did have a great career uh, in midgets and Silver Crown cars and midgets, or excuse me, sprint cars. And uh, it was just really fun talking to him. And uh, it was real enjoyable. Yeah, no, absolutely. Johnny's a great guy. Um, always a pleasure to talk to him. And for next week, we're still um, deciding on exactly who we're going to release. We have a couple different options. So stay tuned. Next week will be a surprise. But I promise it will be a good surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, remember September 27th, we will be doing a live show on McGilvery's and Speedway at 7 p.m. Eastern time. If you're in, in Indiana, 7 p.m. If you're, if you're hey if you're traveling out of state i don't think anyone will but it's 7 p.m eastern time uh yeah i i'd be very impressed if somebody traveled for uh from out of state if you travel out of state again. you come up to us and scott Bally will buy your dinner i will do that i will do that i will absolutely do that there's gonna be like 30 people there out of state yeah I, yeah 30 people on one tab that would be that would be the Scott Bowie luck right there. But um yeah, no September twenty seventh. We're definitely looking forward to it. Um so we, we have a couple of guests lined up for that, so please come out. Um and it will be a good time and yeah, hopefully, you know, we can make it a monthly show. Um but yeah, no, I th- I think it'll be a great time. Definitely look forward to it. Yeah, me <clears> too. I, I am really looking forward to it. And we did a little I may have mentioned we may have mentioned this before, but we went in and did a little test and tune and hopefully got things pretty close. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a few bugs the first show or two, but um, yeah. I'll make I sure mean, I'll, I will make sure I have a fly swatter. Right. Absolutely. A few bucks. Um, but in, in Friday, as you see, I'm wearing my driver like Robbie shirt on Friday. I really, we released the, um, Go car video with Robbie McGee from IndyCar Weekend at Gateway Motorsports Park at the Gateway Cartplex. Go car track is inside the the Gateway um, Motorsports Park inside the the track, the oval. Um, and we got to race me and Jacob, who was in our Jagger Jones video, um, Cardi video. We got to race Robbie McGee inside the track there on Friday of IndyCar Weekend, and man, that was a great time. Um, it's, it's, it's really cool, man, to be able to race current and former drivers. Um, you know, especially someone who drove in the Indy 500 was rookie of the year. Uh, right. you know, had a really good, I mean, you know, he, he was a part of the Indy racing league. Um, and I mean, you know, he finished, he almost won Texas. I mean, he definitely had a lot of talent. He was somebody who he didn't start racing until he was a little older. So it's kind of unheard of now. I mean, if someone starting racing his age and driving to the 500, I don't think you would see that today. Um, but, you know, just Robbie's a great guy. A lot of fun to race against him. Um, you know, he is, I think he's almost, he's almost 50 now, um, but he's fast. He is still very fast. And we learned why he is a professional driver and we are not. And you will see <laughs> that. You will see that in the video. Um, but the coolest thing, I mean, like he just took, he was a first car and he just took off. Of course, and then he actually slowed up because I think he realized he probably wouldn't have caught up with us at that point, and we were we sure as heck weren't going to catch up with him. So he slowed up and you know let us pass him, and we got a race with him a little bit. So that was pretty cool. Um, so you know, once again, thank you to Robin McGee for that. Please check out the video if you haven't, and if you're in the St. Louis area and you want to have a good time, go to Gateway Cartplex because it's actually inside the oval, so you get to do a little bit of sightseeing. Get to see a track where yep. IndyCar races, NASCAR races. So you can see, you can literally see the St. Louis Arch from the racetrack. Yep. And, um, you know, get a race go karts. Really fun go karts. One of the most fun, fun go karts, go karts I have raced. Um, you know, it really gives you indoor. I love indoor karting, don't get me wrong, but outdoor karting, obviously, a little more closer to the real thing, to real racing. Um, but um, yeah, definitely, if you're in the area, definitely check it out. A lot of fun. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I love Robbie. Robbie's been on the show several times and, um, just a great guy. And, you know, yeah, he's he a super nice guy. Always generous with his time. He's in the insurance business now. He, you know, he took over the family business and, um, so he, he don't get to talk about racing much. So when he gets to kind of relive it, 
he um he, he really enjoys it so it's really cool he's just a real big fan of racing the indy 500 and it's cool that to him that you know he got a race in the 500 five times so um you know great guy but yeah, yeah thanks no, sorry go yeah, ahead no, yeah. it, no i was just gonna say yeah what i said earlier he's a super generous guy and he's a busy man and it's just always you know I, typically it's hard to get someone like that to spend an hour, you know, cause they're so busy with work. So that, it was just so kind of him. Absolutely. Um, well, like we said, um, hope everyone enjoys the interview with Johnny Parsons. Stay tuned next week and please make sure you like, and subscribe. If you haven't already, like I said, like subscribe on YouTube. Also check us out on Apple podcasts, Spotify, anywhere a podcast can be found. And remember, September 27th, Psych is out in McGilvery's and Speedway at 7 p.m. if you are in the Speedway area. Um, Until then, hope everyone has a great week. Yeah, take care. Bye. Our guest today is 11-time Indy 500 starter, won multiple Mitsukar feature races, including the 1979 Hut 100 USAC Four Crown Nationals twice, Bellevue Midget Nationals, and the Cooper Hopper World Classic. We're joined by Johnny Parsons. Johnny, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm well. Uh, pleasure to be on with you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, obviously, you had a pretty long racing career. Um, and, you know, I think everyone knows how you got involved in racing, obviously, you know, with, with your dad. Um, talk a little bit about what's your earliest racing memory. Oh, gosh, I remember, uh, like, Right before my seventh birthday, I moved back with my mother and stepfather, Dwayne Carter, and uh, we went to Winchester, and uh, the day that Cecil Green and Bill Mackey got killed, I was like six years old. I remember that, but, gee, I got a lot of uh, memories, uh, but uh, I've, been, I've been pretty fortunate, pretty, pretty lucky. So at what, point, at what point did you realize like, you, you wanted to be a race car driver? Oh, good question. Yeah. Well, it was like, um, my stepfather, Dwayne Carter called my dad and said, he's going to get Poncho and Dana a quarter midget. And if he didn't want me to get left out. So fortunately my father had to cough up probably only a hundred bucks. If that he got a neatest looking little quarter midget. And when I was about 11 years old, we, uh, started racing that with the help of Dwayne Carter and, uh, man, I, I just knew after I got that thing on a little dirt track, Man, this is too cool. I had to had to try and you know follow uh, my dream as far as I could. I I didn't know if I could do it or if, if you know what the outcome would be. I knew I wanted to try, and uh, yeah, that's that's what started the addiction. <laughs> you know, you're sound, surrounded by racing your entire life, um, and as you just kind of alluded, you know, eleven year old today. I mean, they're running. You know, they're running way more bigger, faster cars. You know, you've been around racing your entire life, and uh, but as you just kind of alluded to, you were 11 before you really started getting into your first car. And today, you know, a lot of kids at 11 have been racing for five, six years. Um, so you know, because I think it was like you had to be 18, 21, something to really race. Um, back when you started, did um, I mean, was it one of those things where? You, you ran the quarter midget and then you had to wait a few years, you know, before you got to run something else or did you, were you able to run a few things out in California um, before you come back to the Midwest? Uh, yeah. Well, actually after I outgrew the quarter midget, I got right into a go-kart for Ralph Potter had the dealership in central Indiana for the Curtis craft quarter midgets. And they had a go-kart at the time too. So from 16 to 18, I drove, uh, the go-kart. And then, uh, the summer after high school, I was, uh, by the end of that summer, I turned 19 and went to California because you, they, like you alluded to yourself, that they didn't allow anybody to race back here with USAC or AAA or anything until you were 21. And I had heard in California it, you could drive at 18, and I had uh, family out there, so I got to stay with my dad for a while, got to know him, and, uh, and I drove a three-quarter midget. And then finally, at the end of the following 
summer, I got in a midget at Santa Maria, California, and uh, it just, uh, you know, set the needle in my arm, so to speak. I just, uh, we made the trophy dash first time out, so there was there was some uh, encouragement early on. I, I And I didn't realize that you had moved back here, then went back to California. Um, so let me ask you, that, well, first of all, you mentioned a, a guy that I have so much respect for in Ralph Potter. Uh, I loved Ralph. Ralph was so generous to me and, and my family and very kind and nice guy. I used to talk to Ralph all the time. Um, but, uh, I, I, you know, you said you went out there, made the trophy dash. And at kind of what point did you start thinking, ah, man, I might want to go back to Indiana and try to do this for a living? Well, that was in the back of my mind when I first left here, but I wanted to go out there, like I say, to, to start getting in something before I was 21. And, uh, so I'm out there trying to get experience and, um, needed to get a job. So I was driving a forklift, uh, from 19 to like 22 and, uh, or late 21, I got married just about, uh, almost just about 21. And then, uh, I, uh, Tired driving forklift, like I said, and I saw an ad in the paper for the LAPD. So I took my uh, vacation time off the forklift job and went through the police academy and really liked law enforcement and, and uh, graduated well. So then uh, I was on the police department until uh, got to be that point where I was uh, ready to come back here and uh, and give it a shot. Yeah. Now, would you say your driving experience that you had, did that help you at all in the police department? Not really. Uh, I uh, I got in a few pursuits, but uh, I, I can't say it, it helped me with any driving. <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed law enforcement. Had I not gone racing, um, I would have uh, definitely stayed in law enforcement. And uh, I, I enjoyed it and made a lot of friends and learn a lot too and uh yeah that's cool you told me a story not not too long ago when when i first approached you about doing this show um didn't you say that you have uh, pulled over james gardner yeah yeah jim gardner i pulled him over on sunset boulevard i think it was a sunday afternoon toward the <laughs> beach and uh he had been drive riding his motorcycle in the fire breaks up, up by Mulholland drive uh top of a hill before you get into the LA basin from the San Fernando Valley. And he was uh, driving down to see Phil Hill at that time was uh, a world driving champion and lived in Santa Monica. So um, I I was in a patrol unit, so I didn't really focus that much on um, traffic violations. But if we saw one, we had to stop and cite the uh, violator because uh, we didn't. And somebody saw us, and we'd get beefed over that. So I stopped him anyway. Didn't cite him, but I asked him for his operator's license. And he was real polite and said he didn't have it and it, what he was doing. And I said, oh, okay, well, we got some violations, but you better go get your license before you drive anymore. He probably didn't because he was on his way to see Phil Hill. But after I saw Garner uh, at Riverside International Raceway, about a month or two later, I was out there trying to get a ride and anything. Then uh, we visited out there, and then as time went on, fast forward to when he drove the pace car at Indy twice, and I'd see him in Ontario. We'd, he'd always take time and visit with us, and he was always uh, appreciative that I didn't give him a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's a that's a great story. It's just a small world, right? Like, what are the chances of that happening? <laughs> Oh yeah, a lot of coincidences in life. If you if you live long enough, we all had them. But that was pretty cool. And uh, like I say, I enjoyed it. And uh, most everybody else thought I was throwing a career away. But most of the other police officers that were I worked with had been second, maybe third generation law enforcement. And uh, the captain of the division in West LA, uh, he he kind of understood. I said, man, I'm going to regret it the rest of my life. But I'm 23 years old. If I don't do this now. <laughs> right. So um, they they picked it up as a, a positive. And so so you did the police. Um, you were part of the police force in LA for how many years? And what and what about what year was this? 
uh, uh, just a couple of years in 68, came back here in 69 and, uh, started my jobs and, uh, I've been working as often as I could and, uh, just trying to get some laughs, you know? So, I mean, no, 74. So 74 was your first time making the 500. So, I mean, at that point, obviously your dad, um, had won the 500. So when was the 500 kind of on your radar? Like how important was it for you to race at Indy? Well, after I figured out I could maybe be a race driver, <laughs> even racing a midget, then I was all full of confidence and, uh, as a young person would be. And, uh, uh, that was it. You know, that was just the main focus. Uh, and you know, when, when you have, uh, some abilities and something to bring to the table to be successful at, then, uh, you're encouraged to give it a hundred percent, which most, a lot of guys have, you know? So I was pretty fortunate. Uh, you know, I worked with some patient people like Bill Finley. He, he gave me my first start and, um, uh, we, well, first time I got on the, the big track was Ontario Motor Speedways, which you know is just like Indy, banked a little more in some corners. But uh, they Mario Andretti, they asked him to take me out in the pace car, just give you a little story. So he took me around the track, and he said, you can go down to the number one marker and back out of a little bit. Don't touch the brake. Get back in the throttle. And then, uh, and then just keep doing that. He didn't, you know, he was just throwing me in the deep end and I said okay so I get out there and I go down to the three marker and the two mark I'm saying there is no way that this car is going to stay on the track if I keep driving I just I just didn't know that was a, you know that was a whole new area for me you know so um, I I had, I got through my rookie orientation test and I came in and uh, Bill Finley said okay um let's go out there and see what, what we can do. So I went out there and came back and it's just like when you don't qualify fast, you come into pits and nobody says anything. So, okay, I'm, I'm waiting for him to tell me and we get back in the garage. I said, okay, Bill, what, what happened? He says, well, you went about two mile an hour slower than the final phase of your, your rookie test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so <laughs> back at the hotel room that night, I was up most of the night looking at myself and then mirror calling myself every chicken name you can think of. And so I knew that the next day I was going to go out and kill myself. <laughs> I, I did. I stepped up and went down in the corner and this was an old, an old car. It was the oldest thing there, but I was happy as heck to be in it. And it was capable of going quicker than what I was doing at the time. But I went out there the next day and this, this will give you an idea of, of part of the addiction. You remember, you ever go to a swimming pool when you were a kid and you, and you got the low diving board and the high diving board? Yeah, sure. It, and, the, and the low diving board is no problem. But when you get up there about 15, 20 feet and you look down, you say, oh, my gosh, you know, that's my hurt. <laughs> You're thinking that and your buddies are down there looking at you saying, uh-huh, I'm going to be a chicken. Well, if you remember, you jump off the high door diving board and you survive and you just can't wait to get back up the ladder. So you take it down into turn one and don't touch the brake, but you got to get off the throttle and you get through that first turn and you live, you survive. <laughs> so when you're going down the back straightaway, you're looking forward to, you know, the thrill. It's just the, the adrenaline. Anybody's driven a car, you can't come in after qualifying and hold your hand perfectly still. Not unless you're out there, you know, just stroking around, putting around. But if you're going to qualify for something, you better have the adrenaline shake in your hand. <laughs> So when you, I mean, finally make Indy, like, just describe, like, I mean, the feeling on race day. And, well, I guess really back then in qualifying, I mean, it was pretty much a packed house during qualifying, right? But, I mean, just obviously that's the biggest event you had been in at that point. Um, and just, I mean, was it overwhelming, like, all the people and all the festivities? Or kind of how did you deal with that? Well, the, yeah, the, the atmosphere wasn't a problem because, as you know, I grew up around it and saw the people. In it. But when you're in in the car, you don't really notice. You're not looking in the stands, <laughs> especially as a rookie. You're looking right at that groove, you know, trying to feel everything you can with the car. But uh, we we worked up to it, and uh, I didn't get in the car till the last uh, day with only 20 laps of practice because we're running out of time. And uh, I took it. I, I, I just, you know, had it ha hanging out. 
And they had a little push in there. I thought for sure I was going to knock the wall down off, come off every corner. But uh, it was it was pretty stressful, pretty cool. So after qualifying, yeah, it was a big relief. You know, people talk about the weight off your shoulders, and that's for real. And I got a picture somewhere of me unzipping my uniform, taking a big breath, exhaling, saying, man, yeah, making the first indie after all the years growing up around there, and that was the biggest thing, you know, to me at that time. Kind of kind of matches uh, my first son being born, because that's very much of an impact, bringing, you know, having something to do with bringing a kid into the world, you know, that's cool. Right. That, uh... Um, was there anything it, like you'd seen the race, obviously, what, what was like, uh, one thing about being in the race that surprised you, like those first few laps, just how dirty it was or. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. Cause it brought up a, a good answer for me. Yeah. I was in the back a second to the last, I don't know, ninth or 10th row, probably 10th row. And, um, yeah, you're 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 aware of what has happened on the first lap before. So my eyes were big as they could be, and um, it, it's somewhat turbulent. But you know, it, none of that stuff really ever bothered me, except when you get in somebody's draft and you lose the front end or something. You know, you got to be careful not to do that. But you know, so I'm back there watching everything, holding my own. You know, and if you remember back then, they used to have these aerial bombs on the first lap go off in turn two and three. Boom, 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 you know. Well, up to this time, I'm in the backpack. We're going through turn two, and I don't have my helmet taped across the visor. And those, and I, you know, I'm ready to see anything. And those bombs went off, and I'm really happy I had my seatbelt on because I'd have jumped right out of the car, just <laughs> scared the crap out of me. It was pretty <laughs> funny, come to think of it. But I was uh, uh, very aware of what's going on. What was that like, um, you know, at, the, at roughly the same time, you know, Poncho's doing it, Dana's, uh, you know, attempting to become uh, a race driver at the same level. Um, was there like a rivalry between you guys or was it always the very friendly um, type of competition? Well, you know, uh, it, it was kind of friendly at the beginning. Everybody supported one another as we were in quarter midgets when we were kids. And Dana was really talented and good. And, and I, you know, I was like six years older, still am, than Poncho. And I was the one that got in uh, a dirt car first or a midget, you know, because six years older. So, that sure. you know, I, I'm not taking credit for him because he, he's awesome driver, champion, you know, many times. But, uh it, it, you know, he was definitely, uh, I was kind of uh, apple in front of the care. I'm not taking credit for him, but I'm just saying, if you had another brother, an older brother that had some success at the same ability you did, you're definitely going to try and uh, compete with him and beat him because he's kind of a target, you know. So it sure. was kind of a friendly thing on, on my part. But, uh, yeah, Pancho was bound to determine he wanted to beat me more than anybody. That <laughs> was good. It was okay. Pancho we had be some a little good Poncho can get a little intense. He, he can yeah, get a bit intense. <laughs> well, yeah, he's very serious. Always been a serious type of guy. Yeah, sure. he can get intense, but but he learned uh, he learned from me. I can get intense too because we went around and around a few times. <laughs> sure. As you know, most brothers uh, were. Oh, go ahead. I said as most of brothers might. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. You know, Johnny, one thing is, I mean, I think when you look through your career, um, the thing I've always been amazed about is how, how well you always went, not only were you really great on the small tracks too, but man, when it come time to run those big fast joints, you were always fast, always, always fast. And, and what is it about, do you think about your, style or about your ability that that really when it comes to those big fast tracks you could really start to shine well and you know i always uh there's a lot of guys i admired watching and i kind of you know watched tattersall how he run the cushion and watched everybody parnell a and everybody and you get out there and you try different things and these things and 
it was just more fun to, to run a, the cushion. And actually, even above the cushion, one of the most favorite tracks I ran was a Springfield Mile, which is coming up. And uh, I'd always go in there above the cushion, all four wheels above it, and just flat out. I mean, that was the most fun. So I, I like the tracks that you could uh, really do uh, – let your hair down, so to speak. And uh, <clears throat> Syracuse was good for that. But Eldora, I always had a lot of fun there. But what was really good um, was uh, learning the tracks and conditions. And as especially day races, you, you had to anticipate what the track was going to be like and what setup you wanted. And, you know, there's a lot more. There's a lot more into it. Uh, some friends of mine went out to uh, Lincoln Park years ago in the sprint car, that workshop they had. Mm-hmm. And Father Glenn O'Connor was one of them with me and, uh, and, and another Japanese guy visiting. Um, they'd come in and and uh, they said, man, you're trying to kill me. I said, no, go out there and just do this. It'll, it'll work the faster you go. And Father Glenn went out and I told him, I said, hey, and this other guy, this Baptist preacher, is a little quicker than you, so you better get up there for the Catholics. <laughs> so <laughs> Father Glenn would. Father Glenn went out went on over the first turn. As you know, Putnamville has no bank, it, or no wall, and he came flying back in. He had a great time, and he said there was a lot more than this This coordination. He's tapping his head and patting his belly or the other way or whatever. Uh, he's a lot more of that coordination involved than I thought. And, and come to think of it, yeah, a lot of people don't know what it means to steer the car with your throttle or – not use the brakes so much, but uh, you, you know yourself if you've been in a car, uh, it, it takes some work, it takes some effort, it takes some guys more effort than others. But I was always blessed. Yeah, you just you you in, in Poncho and Dana. I, I watched Dana race uh, somewhat, and uh, all had uh, just amazing ability, and you know more than the average person for sure. Um, well, you know, well, as you could as you can imagine, the, the earlier you start in anything, I mean, the Olympic skiers or the Olympics, and, and it, it didn't take people long to figure out why the Norwegian countries were always better in Winter Olympics than anybody else. Well, they, you know, to get to school when they're five, six years old, they had to get on skis, you know. So it, you know, the earlier you start something, the better it is. So you know, we gotta, and then if you're gonna, and then you're gonna find out when you move to the next level, if you, uh, if you want to, you know, be aggressive and take that extra chance, uh, that extra risk, or if you was just want to be a back marker and those people usually don't stay with it too long. But, uh, I, I didn't, and a lot of guys don't want to be called a balloon foot or a back marker, or, you know, hated to get lapped if you ever had to. So we, we always, we always preferred to be aggressive and uh, studied, you know, just studied the setups and, styles and stuff it just like anybody would in in any uh, industry if uh, they want to succeed you know yeah i remember one night at raceway park early 90s uh when bill was running champ car you come over and really uh you know gave him a little advice and just suggested making a few changes on the car and i, I remember uh like bill started like he ran the b he got the top 10. He was passing to the top 10 when uh had something break, you know, or something broke. And it was amazing just how your advice and just a few little tweaks and changes, um, you know, just was such a, a major difference in the car. And oh, your- yeah. Well, well, yeah, but, you know, you you guys pay attention too, but it's amazing, like you say. Uh, the right setup, and some guys don't share or don't care to, but I liked you guys always, and if I saw something that might help somebody, you know, uh, except one time when <clears throat> I said track record qualifying at Reading, Pennsylvania, I said, man, I had come in after qualifying. I haven't seen a track like this in a long time, and Joe Saldana come up. He said, where'd you run, JP? Where'd you run? I said, wait a minute. Did you qualify yet? He said, not yet. And I said, well, you see me after qualifications because he was very capable of running the groove I did to beat my time. So I'm not fine. And uh, he was scratching his head, but uh, not too many tracks can you do that. But, man, I always love to, uh, when you could, get up there if it's not too deep to tip you over, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, you know, if you can get up above the cushion and really 
<laughs> you know, a lot, a lot of times people don't realize it just past the edge of the cushion, sometimes, depending on how the track is, it's, it's actually smoother up there. You know? Yeah, um, it, yeah, you're off the, the ledge or the curb, and sometimes there were curbs or, or curbs or ruts that I would actually go in, and it happens pretty quick. You should go in and you use the left rear inside sidewall against that curb instead of the right rear because the left rear won't knock you over like the right rear would. Yeah, and just hold you in place, almost like a slot car. Yeah, if you hit it just right, but as you know, it's like threading needle. Yeah, yeah, you hit it wrong. It's it's going to be a bad day. That's right. Yeah, hey, you guys, I, I got off the subject when you talked about uh, the Indy cars, how well we went there. Well, man, I, that was a lot different than the other stuff that I'd driven. And it's because you don't, you're not over the rear end. It's a whole different feeling from what I had learned with the open wheel stuff that. Uh, if you keep that aggression and once you get it figured out, you know, that's how, that's how all the guys that, that we saw are champions and still the guys that, that run uh, the dirt and the ovals go down to NASCAR, look at Andretti and Foyt started, you know, if you want to, once you get past that learning curve from front engine to rear engine, and it took me a while, I crashed a few times, but like I say, I had patient guy built in and stayed with me and, uh, when we got it figured out, it uh, fell into place. But it was super, super fast. I mean, you, you, you're driving way down the track from where you're sitting, and uh, you're being smooth. And then after a few years, you can do some a few little odd, scary things. But I remember one time qualifying to the Indy, I started picking up a push on my first lap, and I thought, crap, this is going to slow down. So – so then I just, this was my second year. So then I drove down below the apron or on the apron down below the white line. And if I had a little, what would it do? I'd go down there real quick. Of course, it would shake the push out of it for a second, but you couldn't do that for too many laps. You'd heat the right rear up, but you had to be ready to catch it if it wanted to get crossed up. But I, I tell you what, first time, first year in the Indy cars, racing with hot lapping and racing with, Guys like Unser and those, I thought at one time they all must have a death wish <laughs> because they because they were doing some crazy things that I I enjoyed doing a year or two later. <laughs> Man, the you, thing you, that you, you, I'm sorry, go ahead there. No, I was going to say, you know, talking about like some of those guys doing crazy things. I like Spike was one of the first people to say like the one thing that he always thought was crazy was how fast Mario. Um, used to go through the pits because back then, obviously, there was no um, pit lane limit, speed limit. Yeah, I tell you a little story about that. Before I got to drive uh, the third car for Pat Patrick, uh, George Bignati, STP, team drivers to Gordon Johncock and Wally Dollenbach, who had been winners and champions, and and I was happy to be the third car just at that race and. Uh, George Bignotti was great to work with, and th this is bad. So, yeah, so I'm I'm stuffing everybody's tire in, uh, carburation day, and enjoying every lap of it. And George Bignotti says, okay, now I want to simulate, sit here on the pit wall with me. Now, when you go out, I want you to go out and simulate a pit stop. When you come in here, I'll clock in and go on out. I said, okay. So I did that normal deal, come in, and then he said, okay, now I clocked you from when he went in and came in. And you're like, six seconds slower than Gordy. I said, wait a minute. How could that be? How could that be? Because I did everything. Good. He says, well, get this. George says, Gordy tells me he's coming through the pit gate flat out. And then I remembered what guys told me when I was a kid and starting off. He says, well, he puts his pants on the same way you do, right? right. So I said, okay. You know, and I was, I was going to do it. If he could do it, I could do it. Sure. So I did that. And that's why the guys hated to pit upstream and change right side tires. Cause you come in there at about 180, 200 miles an hour back in 77, even then. And that's, and that's when the pit lane was made of, uh, of, uh, concrete slabs. And when you come in there flat out and you start getting on the brake hard, you hear the brakes start chirping and you're keeping up with it, keeping it in front and in front of you and, and then making it down. And so I did that and George says, okay, we're good. <laughs> and I said, well, 
there's more excitement going to be in this race. <laughs> but we only had, but we only had like four or five pit stops back then because we carried a whole lot more fuel on board. You know that's funny. You're you're one of the absolute few guys. Uh, there's just a couple of guys that can talk about what it was like to run a roadster through the ground effects cars, and you're one of the few guys that can talk about what what it was like running those those big horsepower offies with the flat bottoms all the way until the ground effects as well. Um, at any are, was it one of those things that was just small learning along the way as the cars would change? You just learn a little more and learn a little more. Oh yeah, I got in uh machine machine car once and uh shaking it down and you know, cut one fairly decent lap and came in and said, Hey, that's not bad. We're only a few miles out of our office. I said, Wait a minute. You guys better check your watches because I haven't even started possible on this thing yet. It's it's all built in. I mean, the technology, aerodynamics, I mean, it's amazing. You don't drive any harder, but you're going faster. So it was right. kinda cool with those uh with those changes. But uh, yeah, I got to I got to see the flat bottom cars, then the ground effects cars. There's more of a learning curve there. But one of the neatest flat bottom cars, which is before ground effects, is uh, uh, when I drove Lindsey Hopkins' lay down car. It was a it was a turbo offy that you know back in '73 we used to turn the boost up to get like 1,200 horsepower. Right. And and the boost had, the boost had a lag in it because they had a bigger snail, the turbo. And, uh, man, when that boost, when that lag would come in, that boost would go from like four or 500 horsepower to a thousand. And so you had, back then you had to learn that little edge, like, you know, feather and a light switch or something, because you didn't want to have it jump right out behind you and spin out. So, uh, that was a pretty good thing. And then they came up with smaller snails to help that, <clears throat> but, uh, the flat bottom cars that Roman Slobodinsky designed that Lindy Hopkin lightning car. And that thing was the sweetest flat bottom. We drove that in 79 and 80 at Indy, but it always broke a piston. We're trying to keep up with the, uh, four cam mm -hmm. Fords, of course, then. And we had to stress it a little bit more than we wanted to and usually pop the piston. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, the, the offies just got to be at such a disadvantage there at the toward the late end of the seventies that it just had too much headwind. Yep, turn the page, another another page yeah. of history. But they were fun to drive. Always loved to drive them. Offies were cool. Yeah, no, it, it, beautiful sounding race car. Now, you know, we're talking about the car, obviously the cars, all the cars you drove, there's big progression in the cars. Another thing, obviously, you got to talk about is the safety. Um, obviously, I mean, you know, you drove up to, what, 96, and the safety from 1969, early 1970s, 1996, obviously, I mean, was a huge difference. I mean, you you saw probably the fire suits evolve quite a bit, obviously the helmets um like did you guys have helmet do they do they start doing the helmet restraints in nine in the mid 90s oh with the hans device well i know the hans device was until like early 2000s but did you guys have any type of head restraint in the 90s no we wore a, a donut around oh, our donut. neck okay. some of it, some thicker some thinner and then on the high banks i wore a lanyard strap uh, yep. on the pavement traps under under my left arm to hold the helmet up but uh yeah the uh the indy cars changed quite a bit because back then uh 75 in around there i remember you know those eagles <coughs> the 72 eagles were and, and all the eagles until the carbon fiber were were pretty good uh they they got beefed up more after 73 those bad accidents at indy but <coughs> they had to beef up the um bulkheads but even at that uh they're aluminum tubs with the fuel bladders in them so you take you know get off in a long race and you get relaxed in the cockpit and relax you know try and relax but you're also you know fired up with adrenaline so you you tighten up your belts after you get settled in the cockpit but you come in the pits and take on 70 gallons of fuel all of a sudden the sides of the car start closing in on you and you had to loosen <laughs> up your belts again <laughs> because it got a little tighter than you wanted, but uh, they they were kind of like 
driving a beer can and, and you know, it was a sad day in 73 when we lost Art Pollard because the car just came apart. You know, they didn't have the bulkheads beefed up enough yet. And then oh, I mean, just couldn't withstand the forces back then. But Jim Malloy was another good friend in a, in a 72 Eagle. <clears throat> he was faster than anybody until he got killed there in turn three. But, uh, yeah, we uh, we appreciated the carbon fiber when I went head on in the wall. Uh, with a march and uh, just tore up my legs and ankles a little bit or well I was only in a wheelchair three months but out for a year but uh, technology saved me there because the wall came up to the windshield just in front of my hands and my knees got stuck behind the dashboard and the rest was a but Dr. Trammell did a great <laughs> job putting me back together you know that's the yeah, thing I, I, I remember you come to the speed room, uh, you know, you'd come out to the speed room and watch and stuff. And, you know, it, and it was, is always, it always amazes me to see somebody who's, you know, going through serious injuries and you can just see them getting a little better and a little better. And then pretty soon they're back in the car. Well, yeah, as you know, anybody, uh, you don't want, and all you're playing with you thinking that uh, it's going to slow you down or anything so actually i was i got in a midget in northern california in november of that year for jim wellington he had a four six but that was pretty gingerly yeah uh went through a lot of physical therapy which is okay but you know hey i can't complain because i knew I, I was kind of surprised i made it past 30 but you know uh, I'd seen a lot of carnage as a kid and I knew what the risks were. So I just accepted it, but I wanted to get back in a car ASAP just to make sure it didn't play any mind games with me. And we were leading in points with midgets, uh, at the end of May, the following year. And then uh, I got, uh, I, I was in the Indy car and I couldn't run a whole lot of midgets after that. Right. Now you you were talking about um well well first off I was gonna say you were talking about um you know having feet injuries and stuff I always heard people say you can tell if someone drove an indie car in the nineties if if they limp right because everyone was going you know head head first into the walls and just the way when you look at those cars I mean your feet were I mean right up there to the end of the nose yeah it was a good rule another good safety feature they added a bulkhead to the front and i'm sure that saved a lot of people but uh, something that had to be done you know yeah i'm i'm, I'm pretty happy they got away from wooden spoke steer, uh, wheels too and, and <laughs> they don't use wire they don't use wire spoke wheels either anymore <laughs> no that uh yeah one thing about it you never want to let the engineers design the car because the engineers are not going to design safety into the car <laughs> They're going to design the fastest race car they could build. And well, they have safety foremost in mind. I know uh, Roman you know what I'm saying, no, You yeah. know what I'm saying? No, you get some of those engineers, man. They to them, their drivers are just just you know they're replaceable. They just want fast race cars. <laughs> yeah, expendable. Yeah, one guy comes to mind is Colin Chapman. I always believe mm -hmm. you couldn't be too light. Yeah, but you know, hey, that's technology, and that's why we have sanction new organizations and make things safer and tony george did a lot I, i'm glad to see the soft balls but i'm here to tell you they're not soft they're just uh energy absorbent walls <laughs> right well they're softer than that concrete we uh where our shop was you know you used to come to our shop we had a jig that was actually made out of uh some of the soft wall uh the guy in front of us sawed up all the pieces for uh at least some of the demonstration stuff, you know, the, uh, the, uh, all the research when they were doing research on it. And R &D, bunch, yeah, sure. yeah. And he had a bunch left over and we made a, a jig to fix cars with the, what he had left over. There's great. Nothing I got, about I, I, it. No, no, but I, I like people being resourceful like that not letting things go to waste. <laughs> oh, it was perfect. No, we loved it. Yeah. Good. Cool. So how's Eddie Bowie doing? Dad's getting around, you know, he's on a walker now. Um, but he no, really? yeah, oh, he's been he on a walker. He's been in a walker for a little over a year. Uh he drives oh, down down yeah. to Walters oh, about every other day. He goes down there and you know, sits in a chair and offers I, his I, expertise I, on stuff. 
I know he's great. I've been down there before. Uh, I, I know he does the crossword puzzle every morning. Probably the same one I do. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah, Dad still gets around questions again, though. Your dad was one of the first guys that gave me a midget ride when I came back here, just after I left the police department in California. I think it was a little bull, little bull ring pavement track by St. Louis. Lake Kill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about it yesterday. He and I were talking about that yesterday. Is, is that right? Did he tell you who my team driver was? There was two cars there. I forget who he was taking care of the cars for. Uh, well, it been Gilhausen probably. Um, I don't remember who the other driver, I, we didn't talk about who the other driver was. Oh, that's right. It probably was, uh, uh, Carl, Car Carly, they called him Carly, yeah. but the other driver was Jigger Saroy. Oh, I didn't know that. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good uh, guy. He's a lot of fun. Oh, that's fine. See if yeah, Andy we... remembers. Ask oh, Andy he if he remembers. <laughs> I'll, ask I'll ask him tomorrow. Okay, cool. So we, you know, we we're talking about, you know, obviously how much indie cars progress throughout your career. Um, and so, I mean, what, what was, I mean, you're talking about like, you know, going from the front engine car to rear engine car. What was the kind of, I mean, you were, your career was so diverse. I mean, you went from driving probably an indie car one day to, you know, a sprint car, midget car the next day. Like, I mean, was, how hard was that to kind of adapt to the different cars or was that just something that you just got used to and could just pick up like riding a bike? Yeah, just like riding a bike. Yeah, I mean, we spent a lot of time in the uh, short wheelbase midgets, which are really good for your coordination. And uh, then sprint cars, the brute horsepower, how you can harness for that or hook it all up. And the guys you work with over the years, you know, um, Mike Devin, uh, his son is doing real good, uh, DRC. But Mike and I had a lot of fun racing the Indy cars for Lindsey Hopkins. He's been a long time good chief mechanic. And Mike and I are actually going to do a talk together at the Lara factory, September race, 16th. Race chasers. Race chasers That's race what it is. Yeah. 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 They just, they just asked Mike and I to do that. And we said, well, heck yeah. Cause you know, I, it's pretty obvious. You guys know that I'm not shy to share on any <laughs> experiences no. that I survived from, but Hey, uh, it, it, it's always a good time. I enjoyed listening to Al Jr. And uh, Mike yeah. Lashman uh, last month. And it'd be a good time for everybody just to hang out and ask silly questions. <laughs> well, absolutely. No, it's, that's a good time. Brace chaser is a good time. Yeah. That, um, uh, you know, so I watched you. Well, there's two memorable days. One, one's good for you, and the other one's not. <laughs> I uh, I watched you destroy the field at Ducoin in that Champ Dirt Car. I mean, that was when you were driving for Nolan, uh, not Nolan, but uh, oh, oh, Gene Nolan. No, nah, not the Gene, yellow, but uh, yeah, the, the, the yellow, yellow car. Well, that yeah. was Gene's car. Yeah. Was that Gene's car? Uh, I'm you were, sorry. I, I, were you thinking of Glenn Nival? Nival. That's what I was saying. It was Nival's yeah. car. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because he he and uh, Gene worked close together. They sure. they were tight. And but but it was Gene Nolan. Yeah. And do you know that that day? I don't even think it was uh, ninety two or three somewhere around there. Anyway, that day. Here's a good trivia question. You guys might want to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, of all the guys. All the cars over the years, and this goes back to the beginning of the 20th century, because they didn't have a lot of racetracks. So everybody raced on mile fairground dirt tracks or even small county fairground half mile. But um, Barney Oldfield set a record of 60 miles an hour in 1903 at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. In, uh, in 19, well, I set a record during 75, but Another one is still stands today from 95 along with Barney Oldfield. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. But, uh, Gene, uh, Gene and I ran Ducoin and, uh, ran a hundred miles in uh, a record time that still stands today. And when Gene passed away, passed away knowing that he had the record as a car owner for the yeah. fastest yeah. 100 mile race on a mile dirt track. And here's the trivia question. What engine over all those years 
was it a four cylinder like an Aussie, or was it a V8, or was it a six cylinder, or what was it? What would you guys think? Well, uh, your car, I know exactly what it was. I don't know what Barney had. <laughs> yeah, Barney. He had a big inline V8. I don't know. He had an inline yeah. six or eight. So. But if you know, if you know, uh, when Ibel developed the V6 and Gene got yeah. onto it with it. And uh, yeah. that, that's a good trick question because the race went 56 minutes and three seconds. So keep that yeah. in mind if you're clock, if you're watching these other guys on mild dirt tracks because they can beat it any day. But uh, the, there was a, a – see, Kenny Jacobs went 60, 56 minutes, five seconds, and uh, Hewitt went 56 minutes, seven seconds, and that was a Springfield. So uh, that's kind of – that was kind of a neat thing to have, you know. Oh yeah, no, it's awesome. I and I'll tell you what, it was every bit, it was every bit the the butt kicking that it sounded like. It, it was a man, you destroyed those guys. Yeah, I I actually um, I go spot for uh, Shane Hollingsworth at the Little Five Hundred. He drives for uh, Jeans, well Jeans' son now, but he drove for Gene for a long time, and I spotted for yeah. Shane a little bit. Rick Laughlin obviously spotted a long time too, and takes care of all that. Um, so yeah, I really like Gene. I, I miss Gene. Gene was a good guy. He was always good. To yeah, good people. That was uh, that was a neat car. The first time I got in it was it uh, let's see it was an eight, 89 or something at Springfield on the mile. I showed up and my car didn't even show up. They said <laughs> it blew up on the dyno the day before, but the mechanic just didn't get it ready. I didn't know that, and so. I went around and there's two cars in this V6 didn't have a driver and Glenn Ivel asked me to take it out and Gene Nolan said, Hey, if you don't like it, then you don't have to qualify it. I said, I don't have much choice. It was either that car or the Mateka 31 car. So I took the V6 out and I come in from hot labs. And if Bobby was the only one there, they were still out at the wall and I got out of the car and said, Dang, this thing's a rocket. <laughs> yeah. And we ended up qualifying on the pole alongside of Chuck Gurney in that lightweight Watson chassis of uh, Junior Kirsch's car. And we yeah, were back plastic, and forth. That plastic express car, yeah. Yeah, that thing was light and fast. Oh, it had, to, yeah. had a good engine in it. And uh, so we, uh, so Gurney was saving his tire and we got by him. And then uh, he, he uh, it just stuck a needle in him and got back by us. We ran second to him, and then we went to Duke Coin. And um, you know that's a that's the only thing on two tight tracks like Sacramento, where you got the V six was a momentum car. You just had right. you couldn't get out of the throttle very long or very much at all, even with the sprint car. But uh, you had a weight advantage, which really worked good for gas mileage and for tires. As you know, with that V6 at Anderson, even you, you didn't, you know, it didn't burn that much fuel, and those things are light, so it worked good. Yeah, no, it didn't. I think at the time, didn't it still have the the single body throttle deal, like the, um, you know, like the like single throttle. Yeah. Yeah. I ran it. I ran it that way. Uh, it all responded well. It all worked good, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, the other, the other day was, I remember, man, that midget crash you had at Richmond. Oh, man. That, that's one of the hardest midget crashes I've ever seen in person. Did you see my helmet after that? No, I didn't see your helmet afterwards. I saw your hand sitting on the header. I saw yeah, that. so did Gene, Gene Nolan, and you guys were on the inside of the fence, inside turn yeah. three and four, couldn't get, couldn't get to me. And fortunately, my glove stayed on, and uh, you yeah. guys hollered out, and said, hey, get his hand off the header. And I, yep. did, I didn't have very, I had very little mark on my uh, pinky on my left hand now, but that's because we didn't have a net on the left side in that car. The car was pretty good, but I don't know what I hit or something, but it got loose and I overcorrected and went back into the wall with the left side, which doesn't have the offset, you know, and my helmet actually hit, had to hit the wall. It put a hole in the helmet and I saw that and said, how in the 
the Lord's got something in mind for me here because I, I, I shouldn't be lying. You know, that's one of the times anyway, but man, it was, yeah, uh, that was, I didn't know that part of it. That, that, that thing I watched it, I watched you going in through three, it twitches a little bit. You try to catch it, you know, I had to rack in it. That thing just snaps, it snaps right, which is puts the left side in the fence. You know, man, it was that is as vicious of a hit in the midget as I've ever seen. Yeah, I've never seen a broken helmet before either. But and, yeah. and it, it, I only went to, to that track one other time and I went to the hospital <laughs> and I was driving Gene Nolan. I was driving for Gene. We had to run the B. I couldn't get him to put a stiff enough bar in the right front. So we're running in the middle. We're getting ready to transfer from the B to the A. And uh, some guy run in the back of me. And I spun. And I'm sitting there. And here comes a rookie in Matekas three and one car. It was like half a straightaway back. Went to the yellow light. Drove right into the side of us. And I had a fracture in my left knee. So uh, I get out of the car. And I'm sitting on the left rear, and I'm not, and I'm not well. I'm not able to go over and knock this guy out. So I'm sitting on the left rear flat tire, and there's a little oil fire because it destroyed the oil tank. And 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 the fire crew guy comes up. I kind of hate to forget his name. And I said, he said, well, okay, we better get out of here, and get a little fire. And I said, well, I'm afraid to put any weight on my left leg. And he just scooped me up, and he wasn't any bigger than me. He carried me down into the ambulance and had x-rays. Oh, this is cool. Obviously. And I had driven my mother down there. My mother at the time was probably 82, and she loved going to races, obviously, married to two Indy 500 drivers. Right. She, was, she took care of our quarter midgets when we were kids. Anyway, she uh, she... She took me from the hospital back to the hotel room and uh, drove over a few curbs. <laughs> and and my luck, the elevator to the second floor was out. So here I'm on crutches <laughs> trying to go upstairs. And so and so we uh, we get in the car the next morning, and I got an ice bag on my left knee. My foot's up on the dashboard, and we drove all the way back from uh, from uh, Virginia. Richmond to uh, Indianapolis, and that was the longest trip I've ever been on. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. Oh, I bet. I can't imagine. So I took the x-rays into uh, uh, the, the people that operated on me years before, and they said, oh, yeah, well, this is in my left knee. It, that's, that one's still in there, but I had the nine in the, in the plate and all the hardware of my right ankle taken out because uh, from the 87 accident and they, because they said, I asked, I said, should I take this out? And they said, well, if you're still going to race, you better take it out. Oh, okay. So I took <laughs> that out and I get pretty good mobility, but my racquetball game isn't near what it was. <laughs> All right. Hey, well, um... Some more good questions. Let's go. Well, I'll tell you what, I got, I got one question I asked. Uh, and I only ask certain drivers that I think can actually deliver a good answer. So I don't ask this to everybody. Uh, and, am and I breaking up? This one here, you're going to have a lot to choose from. So what would you consider your best racing story to be? Obviously one we can share on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My best racing story. There's a lot of fun ones and good ones and I love the IndyCar stuff but something down to so, but one one that comes to mind is uh, MARA I, I went over to run a midget race in the 90s uh, for a guy that built v, V4s Rick Burdeen built nice cars you guys hear me? yeah 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 oh yeah okay you know Rick oh yeah I good know Rick. Fabric. Yeah, good fabricator. And he had V4. And I thought, well, this is good. We're going to go over there and kick butt. So we get there. And there's a, they've been running. MARA has been running, which is now what? Power I, I think. Anyway, mm -hmm. they had been running a, a week or 10-day long deal. But we just went up there cherry picking. And uh, so we unload this nice-looking 48, beautiful midget. Get out there, and the thing blows up in hot laps. 
So I'm sitting in the pits. Okay, we got to stay all night, I guess. And then, so a, a friend of mine, casual friend of mine, this, this, this older guy and his son, Rick Jackson from uh, Kansas City, had their V4. He had the V4 there, and they'd been having trouble with it, and he had been in some of their races, and he was just dog-tired from working on it so much. And he said, hey, Jeff, why don't you get in this and run today? I'm tired, and, and we want you to just drive it. So I got out there, and we qualified in midfield and ran the heat race, and uh, we transferred to the main, and we started, like, I don't know, second, third row or something. But the speed four is, had never hit right. I mean, it was misfiring, and it was oiling. The car looked pretty rad, you know. It, I almost got out of it, but I, I like these guys, you know, and they want to, come on, let's go. We'll be all right. Okay, so we we get going, and I'm holding on. I'm hanging in there, and it's all on the bottom because the top didn't have much on it, and nobody had been running up there. But by running on the bottom so much, and the, and the texture of the, the track is more a lot of DG, but it it, did, it was drying out the bottom, had a little moisture in the middle. And so this engine's about ready to stall when I can see the dash through the smoke, and we're right fourth or fifth or something. And I'm thinking, man, I, I can't do this. Yellow light will stall, and they'll push us off. So they say, one to go. So they give us one to go, and I go into one, and I said, man, I got to keep this engine running. So I get up in the middle of the track to open the throttle, and I said, out a little bit, it's running better, and by golly, I felt some traction up there. So I got out of the throttle. I got some out of the throttle real quick and pulled down in about fourth in line and come off four for the green to restart, and then I lean it up there because I don't want the stall going so slow so it opens it up and we go around them two laps to go we're leaving and these guys are going nuts they they never won a heat race before and here i am just trying to keep the thing running from stalling and i can see through the smoke and i had to change the oil in my uniform after the race but hey we come across the line and you would have thought they had won the board warner trophy i said these guys were so happy and i said hey I said that you guys have the trophy, take the photos, whatever you want. Just give me 50% of the, 50% of the person. We're good. And I have friends for life there. I tell you what, and they, I appreciated the opportunity, but it was a slow, long ride on the way back to Indianapolis from the South Illinois. I tell you that night. Right. Sure. Cause I, can't, I, can't, I had to come back with Rick Bertine and, right. you know, we, I'm sure we would have done what. Yeah, he just saw what was probably going to be his win be their win. Yeah, well, I'm sure we would have done all right. But uh, that that was kind of an amusing thing. But, you know, if you've raced as long as I have, you got a lot of stories. I'll probably think of more that uh, we can share next time we talk. But, guys, it's getting late. i got to take a leak and probably have another beer. All right. All hey, right, Johnny. Well, we appreciate it. Always enjoy talking to you. You know, I mean – uh, you're definitely um, – when I think of that golden era, and I, it's, for me, the, the you know, the 50s, 60s through the end of the 70s, to me, is a golden era. I, you're one of the guys I always think about um, is just being a racer's racer's racer. You know, that, and that's just um, – you know, so I just want to say thanks for coming in and doing this. Man, can't wait to talk to you more in the future. Hey, it's my pleasure, guys. Uh, I've been very fortunate, and uh, I don't mind sharing, obviously, but uh, my pleasure. Yeah, we'll keep in touch. Absolutely. Take care.